Hi, everyone. Welcome to No Kill in Motion. I'm David Smith from No Kill Colorado. I'm very excited today to have Mike Fry from No Kill Learning here. Mike is uh, known for his work of uh, running one of the best shelters in America for years. Uh, he runs No Kill Learning. He's working on a documentary right now called, uh, for, um, called Boots on the Ground. Is that right, Mike? That's correct. And thank right. you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, we're going to talk about that again in the future. I'm really looking forward to what you come out there. The shorts of Boots on the Ground were great. If you haven't seen them, go to No Kill Learning. Check them out. They're also on No Kill Movement, so you can find them in multiple places. Um, but we came here today to talk about Human Animal Support Services, or HAAS, as it's known. Um, this is a evolution in sheltering uh, that is being piloted by uh, dozens of... Um, shelters across the US, they have tier one and, and tier two shelters that are working with this right now. And it's really trying to change the way we look at sheltering and fostering and, and helping homeless pets in America. Um, there's both uh, great support and there is, you know, some concerns and opposition. I wanna touch on both of those. Um, the values of human animal support services, they have five values on their site and I kinda wanna use that as our guide and talk to Mike and see what you think about Haas. So why don't you just give me a general idea of what you know about Haas and what you're thinking about it today? Well, you know, as many people may know, I, my, in terms of my work, I officially retired, you know, a while ago, but I've continued to, you know, keep my ear to the ground and um, so have, you know, am familiar with, at, at, you know, at the high level, at the very least, you know, the ideas of Haas. Um, and I'll just be really candid with you. Um, I warmed up to it immediately. There's all sorts of things in that um, that are, I think, 100% consistent with things I have advocated for in the sheltering world for nearly my entire career. And so um, there are aspects of it that I believe are honestly just the next evolution in, in a logical um, transition of the no-kill movement. What's um, and I think, go okay. ahead. Okay, what's interesting is that actually COVID um, actually forced some of this stuff on sheltering, which was great. One of the things you've talked about for years, I mean, you know, basically, uh, you know, pet retention, pet redemption, um, keeping pets out of the shelter in the first place, really leveraging fostering and things like that. COVID forced that because we needed to get those animals out of the shelter or keep them from coming into the shelter, but still be in a safe environment. And it is something we've been talking about for years and a lot of shelters were saying, oh, you don't know how hard that is. And then everybody was doing it all of a sudden. Some of the things that you have actually practiced out there in the field for years. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, to me, what, it, you know, if you ignore, I think it's interesting that COVID has had such a profoundly positive impact on the sheltering world. Um, and to me, the thing that it forced animal shelters to address, even those that are really nice, beautifully performing shelters, is to realize that number one, even the best animal shelters are not necessarily great places for animals to go. Um, you know, we can do our best to make our shelters clean and friendly and, yeah, and, and all, but it's not the same thing as being in a home with people. It, it just isn't. And so, um, and um, there's been this mindset in the animal sheltering world that, you know, we are, you know, the be all end all of animal care. And so we're going to command and control and be responsible for all of it. Um, but that's dysfunctional, I believe, because I've said for almost my whole career, the number one thing animal shelters can do is to teach people responsible pet stewardship. And what better way to teach responsible pet stewardship than to help people who are struggling with pet issues to keep their pets? Or to, in the case of a lost or found pet, to in, engage the community in coming up with a community solution to that problem that's right there. If, if you can teach the community to reunite those pets, you know, in the field, <laughs> in real time, you know, connecting neighbor to neighbor um, and, you know, and 
that's just so much better than animal control needing to come in and take responsibility and you know take possession of that dog or cat and i mean it's just a much better model and so it's and by default you're teaching people to be stewards of the animals as you teach them to do that and enable that process it's that all good news that is the perfect segue to one of the problems uh that people are bringing up or, or the opposition. And it's a fear of, is the shelter abandoning stray animals? If animal control isn't picking them up, isn't that their job? I mean, I know my opinion, but I wanna hear yours. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, we have to face reality. There's all different kinds of animal shelters in the world, right? There's really great shelters that you know go out of their way to do everything they can for companion animals in their community and there's those who will look for any opportunity to you know blow off their responsibilities that's just the reality no law no policy no change in practices is going to change that fact so um so i think it's absolutely certain that some animal shelters will use this as an opportunity to um you know, not take responsibility for doing their jobs. Absolutely, they will. Um, I get to the, this place, though, is um, if you've got animal shelters that are regressive and don't want to take responsibility for doing their jobs, do you want animals going to those places? I say no, <laughs> you know? I, no, no. <laughs> I think it's much better um, that the community be involved with saving those animals. And I would argue, in fact, Part of my animal advocacy in my community has involved, um, you know, when the shelters were regressive in our community, and I'm so glad that they're no longer in that state, but when they were very regressive, I advocated that people who found stray pets not contact animal control or not contact the animal shelter, uh, because I believe by all regards, you know, the general public could do better. And so, um, so I think that even the downside is actually a feature, not a bug. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, yeah, no, that's a great view. I see that. And, and you, you know, you recently many, uh, Minneapolis and well, St. Paul first and then Minneapolis, right, have actually gotten to the point where um, you can kind of claim no kill in your community. Do you still see, even at that point, how Haas brings a community and or a shelter to the next step, like even further? Absolutely, yes. And I, to me, it gets back to that education component. You know, that old saying, you know, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. Um, I, I believe that as I look at Haas, it is um, in all kinds of ways an, an opportunity for animal shelters for whatever reason to be you know, teaching the community to be responsible stewards for the pets in the community, their own animals, as well as what you might call community animals, um, you know, free roaming cats, you know, friendly, you know, dogs that are out, you know, found loose. Um, you know, we can uh, come together as neighbors in a community and solve those issues. And um, I think it's great to be encouraged to do it rather than, you know, I, I would argue the old animal control model, the old animal shelter model, um, of, you know, we need to be in charge of that. We need to take those animals in and micromanage every detail of that process is kind of um, disempowering actually of the community and um, enabling people to do it is just, um, it's better. Um, I, when I was doing it for the shelters in my community, um, I would encourage people to go out to places like nextdoor.com um, and and post animals there and such a high percentage of the animals that go into those places rather than animal shelters get reclaimed so quickly without being exposed to potential diseases in the shelter i mean it's just everything about it to me is good news Next and Next and the animal shelters when they make that step when they let go of that sort of 
command control nanny um, sort of authoritarian model of animal sheltering. Everything underneath that changes and every bit of that is good news from my perspective. I see, I see great work being done on next door in my own community. You and I have talked about that before and you made me think of the last thing I really wanted to talk to you about. And that is part of the Haas model, which is called justice and equity. Uh, exactly what they say on their site. I want to read it. We consistently work to combat discrimination and inequity in animal services and to build programs and services that are accessible and welcoming to all. This is something you and I have talked about before and recently um, I've been really really looking deeper into this and the way that the animal shelter animal welfare industry has has been a part of marginalizing demographics in america um and i wanted to hear your viewpoint and what you think about this well i think it's really important um and um racial discrimination and regressive animal sheltering have gone hand in hand since the beginning of animal sheltering. Uh, and sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's overt and in your face. The pit, uh, the, the, link, the, the pit bull question is kind of overt, right? Right, yes, absolutely. The linkage between breed-based discrimination, BSL, and racism is overt and in your face. Um, but sometimes it's more subtle than that. And, um, and the shelters that are the most racist and, uh, and inequitable in our society tend to have the highest kill rates because they simply are not reaching out into the community. They're not engaging the community well, and they can't. And, um, and so I think um, it's, and it's also another thing that I think is critical to ongoing improvement in the animal sheltering field is that it requires some um, self-evaluation, you know, uh, a coming to terms with, you know, our beliefs, our core values, and really doing some not superficial assessments, some deep evaluation about what's important. And, and how do we as a community come together and solve the wounds that we have in our community? Because the way we care for animals is directly linked to the way we care for each other, to other people. They're the same thing. And we can't, I believe, fix and uh, our animal sheltering issues without also uh, being better to each other, being better neighbors, being better community members, being better stewards of the planet. It's all this. And, and if you see the Boots on the Ground film that's going to be coming out in October, in the end, that really is the conclusion that we come to. Um, Many of these issues seem separated and disconnected, but they really are the same issue with different faces on it. Right, and I really like, you know, your, your, the self-evaluation that you were talking about. Self-evaluation and self-critique is actually named in, in the house values. And I think it's, I think that's been one of the biggest challenges for animal sheltering throughout its history, is the self-evaluation and self-critique, not just of justice and equity, but of everything. Um, and uh, right. one more question, then I'm going to let you go, because I did start thinking about Nextdoor and the social equity piece and how they come together, right? Because now if we're not bringing animals to the shelter, we're letting the community return animals to owners, if it's a stray pet or something like that. And I feel right there, there's an opportunity where pets that went to the shelter were not, they weren't returned by the shelter because of a certain view of people um or or their circumstances in which this animal didn't belong there um what do you think of that well the notion that animals shouldn't be returned because they don't belong there is really uh, you know i think it's 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 misguided in all kinds of ways um and i'll talk about it in the context of my work on native american reservations you know we did a lot of that um, and particularly when I was active in sheltering at, at the Red Lake Reservation here in Minnesota, one of the most impoverished communities in the United States, frankly, um, when we were there. I think things have gotten a little better, but really um, the median income was dramatically bo below the poverty line. And the, the people on the lower end of the spectrum on the reservation were living, literally living in destitute conditions. Uh, and 
you know, there were no veterinary services on the reservation. Um, you know, uh, their, uh, the native culture there had a different idea of ownership, not just of pets, but of just stuff. Um, and so they didn't necessarily believe in pet ownership. So many of the animals just roamed the reservation and got cared for by multiple people. Um, and so we ended up with, you know, these res dogs and cats that were super social to people because they were being cared for by multiple people um, and getting fed by multiple people, but no veterinary services for them. And they just reproduced out of control. And, and so there was this huge problem on the reservation. And facing that, um, animal rescue folks uh, took uh, looked at that and saw two uh, came to two conclusions. One was, oh my gosh, those native people are horrible. We've got to save those animals by taking them off the reservation and not returning them. Because you know, those people just don't really care for animals because look, I mean, it's right in front of your face how much they don't care for animals. Well, the fact of the matter is none of that story was true. The people loved animals. And when we started doing you know, free um, spay, neuter, and vet clinics by taking our mobile clinic onto the reservation. People would stand in line for hours or days to bring animals that didn't belong to them to that clinic to get veterinary care. And, and I've, so, seen that, I've seen that in very rural areas. You and I have talked about this, some of the spay, neuter clinics we've done in Colorado in very rural areas. They yeah. come in droves. But Mike, I'm going to cut you off because because we're out of time. I think that that subject is a subject for a whole segment. Oh, but, yeah, absolutely. But I'll just add a bullet point to say, ahead. by taking a different approach and providing those services for free, we sterilized those res dogs. The reproduction stopped. The issues on the reservation dramatically reduced. Those animals didn't need to be taken away from those people we needed to empower those people to be better stewards of the pets. And that is exactly what Hask is. And it is, oh, that's great. And thank you actually for making sure I got that last piece because that was incredibly important to that story. But I, I, I almost want to talk about the whole reservation thing on another segment. It would be a great <laughs> conversation. I think you could tell me about a thousand more things that, that I don't know. And that was just great. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm looking so forward to the, uh, the Boots on the Ground documentary and we will have you back again. Thanks much, take care. Bye.